Killer Wives, episode 48. <laughs> These are the case facts against Mrs. Jennifer Faith, who put a hit out on her own husband. Isn't trust a bitch? Dallas, Texas, made famous by the Kennedy assassination. The 55-foot Big Tech statue at the State Fair, but also made famous by the murder of one Mr. Jamie Faith. On October the 9th, 2020, Dallas, Texas will be rocked once again by the heinous planning and execution of an assassination. This assassination plot will take place 56 years and 11 months to the day of the Kennedy assassination in front of the Texas Book Depository. The only difference in this case is that there will be no need for Warren Commission type of inquiry to discover who actually targeted and then killed an American Airlines executive. As that morning's fall sunrise began in the third largest city in the Lone Star State, news stations would hurriedly begin to interrupt their regular scheduled programming with news of multiple shots fired in the Oak Cliff area that would reverberate as far away as Deep Ellum for many years to come. Those shots would be fired by Mr. Darren Lopez. Darren Lopez would drive 600 miles one way from his residence in Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee the night before to Oak Cliff, Texas. Oak Cliff is a community located in a southwesterly direction from the center of Dallas to this corner at South Waverly Drive. From this geographic turn from Google Maps, Lopez had only a half mile down to the home of his assassination target. But Mr. Lopez was no novice killer or stranger of being stealthy. Lopez was formerly a U.S. Army Special Forces veteran who was used to spotting his target in dim lighting. For this reason, Lopez did not arrive during daylight hours, but shortly after 2 a.m. in the morning to familiarize himself with the house that he had never visited. Lopez hung out in the dark of night in a neighboring vacant home. It would be this yard that he would sit until it was time to strike Mr. Faith. What would take place the next morning would be categorized as something akin to a Hollywood movie. A movie involving murder, money, and a latent infatuation between himself and his target's wife. At approximately 7.30 a.m. on the morning of the night, Lopez was roused from his assassin's perch as he heard the occupants of the Faith residence preparing to leave. Jennifer Faith would be the first out of the door. She would exit led only by the family's Bernese mountain dog for an early morning walk. Behind Jennifer would be her husband by less than 15 seconds. 15 seconds that would make a world of difference when it comes to being shot. As Jennifer stepped out of that cozy 72 degree fall morning, she and her husband would get no further than 34 feet from the home door before Lopez would sprint across the adjacent home's lawn and begin to shoot Mr. Faith without mercy at point blank range. He would shoot Mr. Faith who was caught completely off guard seven times killing him. He would shoot him three times in the head, three times in the torso, and finally once in the groin to send a message to a dead man. Jennifer would immediately on cue 
let out a blood curling scream that would summon neighbors to their windows along with multiple 911 calls to the Dallas Police Department. Some would barely catch the end of a gunman getting into and driving away in a black Nissan Titan pickup truck. Other witnesses would state that they saw the shooter duct taping Jennifer's wrist together before knocking her to the ground in an attempt to rob her of her jewelry. But at least Jennifer was alive. Unlike her husband, the American Airlines executive who had plenty of beautiful dreams for the future. Unfortunately, James was cut down in the prime of his life. Cut down less than 24 hours after celebrating their 15th wedding anniversary. After Darren shot Jamie seven times in broad daylight, he took off in a black Nissan Titan pickup with a distinctive T decal on the back window. This one identifying T mark would help to move the case forward as detectives begin their search for a killer. Lopez at this point was blissfully unaware that anyone could have identified him or his truck. You see, during the killing, Lopez wore a hooded sweatshirt and a COVID mask on his face. As for his truck, the windows were tinted, and this trigger man hadn't noticed anyone following him from the scene nor this highway as he took a meticulous Google Maps route out of the city of Dallas towards Tennessee. What Lopez and Jennifer failed to understand during the planning stages is that rarely do people prosper from murder. Typically, everyone loses, beginning with real property. The face home looked modest from the outside, but inside it was a sprawling three-bedroom, two-bath, half-million-dollar home. Here are actual views of each room of a home where a wife, who was not into sharing, would eventually end up losing it all. Yes, Jennifer would lose in spectacular fashion far more than her public face. Jennifer would lose her husband to the grave, her preteen daughter to another family member, her male accomplice, Mr. Lopez, and an ardent admirer to jail. And as for the coveted insurance payout that most of these wives seek, forget it. Insurance companies have a policy of not paying out in the case of mariticide or when a wife kills her husband. Jennifer was about to find out the hard way, similar to wives that have taken this path, is that you end up trading your freedoms and a large home with a pool and jacuzzi in the backyard for a six by nine prison cell for the rest of your natural life. <laughs> Mr. Lopez, for all intents and purposes, had gotten away scot-free with murder. Lopez arrived back in Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee, just short of dinner time on the afternoon of the murder. Comfortably but cautiously, Lopez drove his black Nissan Titan to this secluded property. His home at 1285 Sweet Home Road in the rugged mountainous region of eastern Tennessee. Lopez resided here along with his estranged wife and child in one of the last places anyone would suspect an assassin who just murdered some 9 hours and 32 minutes away. But oh would Mr. Lopez regret not storing his pickup in this red roof shed out of the view of aerial surveillance. Meanwhile, back in Texas, the widow of Faith, who was faithless to her husband, was completing her after-incident interview at the Dallas Police Station to discover who would want to kill James. I just saw this person shoot and shoot and
interviewed call him a nice guy somebody nobody want to hurt who would kill James now the Dallas police gang division would be assigned to investigate because detectives believe this killing might have been gang related I mean who else would shoot somebody in broad daylight seven times and the final time in the groin if it wasn't gang related and during that initial interview Jennifer Faye stated for this record that she heard sounds of footsteps coming up from behind them and turned around to observe an unknown assailant pointing a gun at her and her husband. She says the suspect shot her husband multiple times causing him to fall to the ground first and then he continued to shoot an unarmed man and a defenseless man on the ground. Who would do this if it wasn't gang related? Jennifer then stated that a neighbor saw the killer from across the street Attempting to shoot her as well, but the gun was empty, she said. She remembers running up the driveway and being tackled by the killer, who started beating her and taping her hands together. So this killer actually took the time out. I got a duck roll of tape here. I'm going to tape this woman's hands up in broad daylight. Now, instead of using his fists, she said the, begin the killer began striking her with the palms of his hand now, not a fist, while she was on the ground. It was on that ground that Jennifer says the killer was trying to remove her diamond wedding ring from her hand. So was this a crime that was based upon murder or murder that was based upon crime? Finally, Jennifer stated that she screamed for help, prompting the suspect to flee the scene. So gunshots wouldn't make him run, a murder wouldn't make him, make him run, but a scream would make a murder run. Now nothing of value was taken from James' face body nor Jennifer face person which was rather odd for a robbery that had gone bad. You at least need to make it worth your time, right? Now Jennifer gave a description of the killer to detectives as a medium-built Latino man wearing a blue face mask with eyes that appeared to be black. Now Jennifer did not provide any description of the killer's vehicle though, even though she was standing there at the scene of the murder. Now she knew full well that it was uh, the color of the vehicle and the make of the vehicle but she didn't want to provide that or the license plate to this crime because she knew it would come back to haunt her and back to she was a part of her husband's killing Justin, you're watching Justin, M&M Justin, the men's channel Justin. Jennifer knew the killer in a very intimate way you see, the killer was Army veteran Darren Ruben Lopez. Lopez, at the initiation of the hit, was Jennifer's friend from the past, but in a more romantic way. You see, Lopez was a combat veteran with a traumatic brain injury. At the time, Lopez was going through a divorce in an isolated part of Tennessee while trying to raise his two daughters. Now, many years before Lopez's military career, he had been dating Jennifer at South Point Catholic High School in Tucson, Arizona, and will continue to do so throughout college. Now, the couple initially began dating with the intentions of getting married, but split up when she was finishing college and he was being sent as an army soldier to serve 
in Korea. It would be Darren's career that kept him working for the Special Forces for 26 years after the breakup. Now, while serving in Iraq, Lopez suffered a traumatic brain injury and explosion that injured 25 other fellow soldiers and left him mentally disabled. Following Lopez's retirement, he relocated to Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee, where he would be up until the time that Jennifer asked him to murder her husband. Darren Lopez found Jennifer on the internet and got in touch with her while she was living with her husband, Jamie Faith, an American Airlines technology director. This man had worked his way up from the bottom, clean to the top of American Airlines to provide his wife with a beautiful home, but that was not enough. In March of 2020, the former couple started communicating again via messages, emails, and calls rekindled on an emotional level. Now they even planned their future together. So you see, Jennifer knew her husband's killer that day as much as she recognized him in the past when they were going to school together, dating together, kissing together, at the prom, and God knows what else. Similarly, Jennifer and Miss Lopez manufactured tape with her hands, but not taking any valuables after committing a life imprisonment style murder. Who would do that? This was done to throw off Jennifer's involvement in the assassination plot. If it looked like she was injured and hurt herself, how could she be involved in her husband's murder? I've done a lot of these cases and women do ask the guy to hurt them just prior to leaving the scene. Jennifer would pur purposely leave out a lot of facts that would get her ex-boyfriend captured. Now, although Jennifer was at the scene of the murder, she said she didn't know what type of vehicle the killer left in. Justin. You're watching Justin. Eminem, Justin. The Men's Channel. Justin. The description of the killer's truck would have to come from witnesses at the scene who were really interested in the crime to be solved. As Jennifer's police interview came to a close, she would give written consent to detectives for a cell phone extraction of internal information on her personal phone. Now whether people are innocent or guilty, they sign this particular form. Some do it thinking they'll get away with it. Some doing it knowing that the cops are on their trail. Within a few days, an analysis of the contents of that phone would reveal that Jennifer and her husband were having marital problems at the time of his death. Now, based on text messages reviewed by investigators, Jennifer Faith seemed to be involved in a lengthy emotional affair with an individual identified as Darren Ruben Lopez. Now, I'm just not talking about any type of emotional love affair. This love affair was way too far. Detectives researched data from Jennifer Faye's cell phone and located a telephone number for Lopez, his birth date, email addresses, and his current address. How stupid. Not only would learning this information spell the beginning doom of the killer Lopez, but Jennifer as well. Jennifer was asked to come down once again for a second interview at the Dallas police station. Mrs. Jennifer Faye a most unfaithful wife will be brought downtown here to the Dallas the Police Department so she could testify to what she had on her phone six months before her husband's murder. You see, six months before he died, she had reconnected with an old boyfriend from high school. Dallas investigators began looking into a connection between Jennifer and Lopez when they discovered that Lopez owned a black Nissan pickup truck matching the description of the Titan seen fleeing the scene the day that James Faith was killed. They also learned that Lopez lived in Tennessee, meaning he would have had to travel from the outside of Texas to commit the crime. Now this one simple act would raise Lopez's murder indictment from a state crime to a federal crime punishable by death. You see, when you go across state lines to kill somebody, the federal government gets involved. And because of this, and these revelations, detectives called in the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives because the crime had crossed state lines in the commission of a firearms murder. This guy was in deep trouble, but he didn't research that, nor did she. A lot of people don't know about these murders and what they're going to get from it until after. Thereafter, local and federal investigators obtained a search warrant for the data contained on Ms. Lopez's cell phone as well. You see, when they knew Lopez was in a part of the murder, they didn't have to even go to his door. They could obtain a search warrant that way. 
Investigators began looking at a connection between the pair surrounding the assassination-style homicide that occurred on October 9, 2020. Now, during an analysis of Lopez's cellular records, it was revealed that he and Faith had approximately 14,363 incidents of phone contacts via calls and texts. Now, these messages occurred between September 30, 2020 and October 30, 2020. This time period encompassed the murder of Mr. James Faith. On November 11, barely a month after her husband's death, Jennifer initiated a life insurance claim seeking approximately $629,000 in death benefits from MetLife of New York City. Jennifer then repeatedly updated Mr. Lopez about the status of the claim. At one point, she told him that MetLife was holding up the payout because Jennifer was considered a suspect in her own husband's death. And I cautioned women before who intend to do this, and I do it now. That life insurance policies always wait until the police report. And Jennifer would take to the airways to feign compassion over her husband's death through numerous news interviews. In one interview with the station WFAA in Dallas, Jennifer described her husband's killing and demanded answers from police or the general public that somebody would come forward to help her. She also told a separate affiliate, Fox 4 in Dallas, that it was hard not knowing why her husband was killed, pleading for the killer to come forward and turn himself in. In that one television interview, Jennifer said it's been horrible, devastating. She says, I teeter between being heartbroken and completely devastated. You see, this is what happened after you kill your husband. They continue acting. It's nowhere near the truth. She said every day has been awful. Here is a brief snippet of an ABC8 interview in which she willingly gave after her husband's death. I mean, 15 years together. He would give you the shirt off his back. Now nearly two months apart. He worked for American Airlines. He was an IT director. Jennifer Faith told me about her husband, Jamie. It was a normal day. And the morning he died, October 9th. We got up. We did our normal good morning thing. At 7.30, they walked their dog outside their Oak Cliff home when they were ambushed 15 feet from their front door. And I heard running behind me, and I turned around, and then just shooting just started. I was running up this driveway, and uh, he tackled me and started beating on me and taped my hands together. Jamie died at the scene. Police have not made any arrests, but they released this picture of the suspect's truck. It's a black Nissan Titan extended cab. It had a, um, a Texas Ranger sticker in the back window. And sadly, this is just one of many high-profile violent crimes in Dallas, a city with more than 200 homicides this year alone. I'm sure they're overextended and spread very thin, but it doesn't, it doesn't help me in terms of finding the answers that I really need. In an instant, Jennifer lost so much. My partner, my best friend. And now, she waits for closure. I just, I'm not supposed to be widowed at 48, you know. She hopes the suspect does the right thing. I just hope that at some point, maybe this person can recognize the gravity of what they've done. In Dallas. And feel some sort of guilt enough to come forward. I'm Alex Rosier. Following Jamie's killing. One of Jennifer's neighbors from across the street created a GoFundMe account to help Jennifer and her daughter. Now, unbeknownst to that neighbor was that Jennifer withdrew $58,000 from that fund to pay for purchases made on two credit cards Jennifer willingly mailed to Mr. Lopez. Jennifer also used the credit cards to pay for expenses Mr. Lopez and his family purchased airline tickets for Mr. Lopez and his daughter and paid FedEx to ship, listen to this, a television, a very large flat screen television to Mr. Lopez. If there ever was a payoff for a crime, this spelled it, and her due. Jennifer funneled all but a few thousand dollars of that money to Lopez. But Lopez was not merely motivated by money and the killing of Jennifer's husband. We're going to find out in just a minute why he really did this. Who would shoot somebody three times in the head, three times in the chest, and one in the groin? Lopez killed Jamie to protect Jennifer from what he perceived 
was in an abusive relationship with her husband. You see, apparently from the outset of reconnecting with Jennifer, she had been feeding him lies about James to get him angry enough to kill her husband for her. And in a lot of these cases where women motivate men to kill other men, it's because they tell them that they've been abused or sexually molested by their own husbands. Now Jennifer would use two manufactured email accounts to dupe her former boyfriend into believing that her husband of 15 long years was physically and sexually abusing her on a daily basis. Now, and this was done as a way of justifying the murder plot. If this was happening every day, she could have just went to the police. Now, Jennifer created a fake Gmail account in her husband's name early in that year on April 2020. So you would create an account using your husband's name. That's false. Now then posing as her husband, Jennifer emailed Mr. Lopez multiple times during the spring and summer of 2020. She would taunt Lopez with details of extreme physical and sexual and emotional abuse that had never actually occurred. So she's actually pissing off Mr. Lopez so he could come and save her as a white knight. On April 10th, 2020, Jennifer attached to an email fake internet stock photos of injuries as bogus proof of the domestic violence. You know, these any photos that people can stock photos people download from the internet. Now attached to those photos was this response supposedly from her late husband. And he was quoted as saying, I'm telling you to stay away from my family. So she would ego on Mr. Lopez and then say her husband said, stay away from my family. The comments continued on saying, enjoying that you can do not a fucking thing about it. Jennifer wrote in a separate email to Lopez attached close up photos of phony bruises that Jamie slapped Jen. Then she sent a picture of him choking her. She sent a separate email posing as her own best friend, so a separate woman that didn't exist, to Lopez on May 13, saying, I am asking if you are willing to get involved and help Jen get out of this abusive situation. So it wasn't enough that she posed as her husband in a phony email. She created another account to pose as a phony girlfriend of hers. On May 20th, Lopez replied to that fake email sent by saying, I know I won't feel better about her situation until she is out of the house and away from him or let me put a bullet in Jamie's head. Now this documented what was going to happen in the future. She had every chance in the world to stop that, but she didn't. She kept on egging it on until we got to Mr. Face Death. Now Jennifer, still posing as her friend, allegedly wrote back, I am also very concerned and if it were up to me, I would tell you to go forth with your idea. She closed that email out by saying, laugh out loud, I'll give you an alibi. So she's willing to give him an alibi for killing her husband. Then in a follow-up email on July 26, she again posed as her girlfriend saying, Darren, I talked to Jen. He's burning her among other things. So now he's gone from physical, emotional, sexual abuse to burning her. It was seen that Jennifer had clearly been preying on her ex-boyfriend's protective instinct as a white knight in order to convince him to execute her husband. And he would do so in broad daylight with the neighbors across the street looking out the window. Then the pair texted and called one another hundreds of times every day in the days before Jamie Faye was killed. The last text Lopez sent prior to leaving Tennessee was at 1.07 p.m. on October the 8th, the day before the shooting. Now following that text message, However, the two phones suddenly stopped communicating with each other for a period of over 28 hours. Now this happens in a lot of cases. A lot of people will turn off their phones prior to committing a murder. Now records will reflect that Lopez's cell phone was turned off during a substantial portion of his travel time. So the time he left Tennessee to Texas and back, he made sure his phone was turned off. Only for a brief time, it did turn on. That also affected his case. The Dallas police officials engaged Tennessee investigators with the assistance of the ATF to confirm if a truck matching the description of the shooter was at Lopez's property. On November 20th, ATF agents conducted a high altitude aero surveillance of Lopez's home in Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee. Now it would be there that they spotted a black Nissan Titan with a large white T decal on the rear window. Now, if you remember before when I talked about his home, I told you earlier that Lopez wished that he had parked that truck in that shed with the red roof. A lot of people wish in these cases 
that they had done things after their court, after they were arrested, and before they even had the idea to start it from the beginning. Over several days in early December, ATF agents kept an eye on Lopez in and around Cumberland Furnace. Photos that agents took to show that someone had placed a white decal on some kind of the, of the tailgate of the vehicle. This was done to throw off the investigation to make it look like this was not the original truck. Lopez had seen his truck in the news, so he wanted to disguise the truck. The other damning connections to the murder was surveillance footage captured showing Lopez at multiple stops now along the way to kill Jamie, including a Pilot Travel Center truck stop located at 3400 Service Loop Road in West Memphis, Arkansas, as seen in these photos. In this photo, Lopez is wearing clothing that matches the description given by witnesses to the shooting, including a blue face mask Jennifer Fave told police about. Wow. At this pit stop, Mr. Lopez filled up his gas tank, bought some food, and a Red Bull energy drink to keep him alert for the very long trip from Tennessee to Dallas. The next time Lopez would text Jennifer or Faith would be more than nine hours after her husband's death. I wonder why. Now then it shows that by that time, Lopez was back in Tennessee and only about 62 miles short from his mountaintop home. This particular timeline is consistent with Lopez making the 650 mile drive from Cumberland Furnace to Dallas and back if he left Dallas shortly after killing Jamie Faith. That's why I told you this was the second assassination attempt of somebody in Dallas. Now prior to leaving Tennessee, Mr. Lopez told his daughters that he was going out of town on a hunting trip for a few days. He must have been hunting for humans, because according to debit card records, he filled up at a gas station near his house, set his GPS in his car for Face House, and headed west for a 10-hour drive to Dallas, Texas. Now, I don't know about you, but Tennessee has a bunch of areas where you could hunt. You don't need to come to a different state in Dallas, 10 miles, I'm sorry, did I say 10 miles? 10 hours away to hunt. Now, despite Lopez's cell phone records showing thousands of communications between the two phones in the months before James faced murder, most of those communications were not present on Jennifer's phone. So they showed up on his phone, but not hers. Dallas police believe that the communications with Lopez's cell phones were intentionally deleted from Jennifer's cell phone. Now, this was done prior to the phone being given to detectives. So she thought she was a smart woman. She thought she had covered all of her bases but they should have been deleted off his phone as well, but they were not. Now, one of Jennifer's texts to Lopez on December the 3rd of that year stated her concern about investigators were on to the T on the glass of his truck. She watched the news. She talked on news. She knew what they were looking for. She texted him that she had awoken in a little bit of a panic. She says, something is eating away at me, telling me you need to take the sticker out of the back window of the truck. She should have said something was eating at her conscience or her soul for even getting this man in this situation. To that, Lopez responded that he was working on the sticker a little at a time, making it appear that the adhesive was wearing down. He said he didn't want to take it off immediately. Oh no, not all at once, because his daughter had given it to him and the family would notice it was missing. Imagine the family would notice that they seen on the news that it matched his truck. Imagine his family that his daughter gave him a gift. Why would father take it off of a truck? Do you not like me? To that she said, oh, okay, good. Fresh wrote back, thank you. The new decal on Lopez's tailgate appeared the very next day. He put another one on there to fool cops. He texted her on December 6th to say the tea sticker was gone, but it was too late. They already did the flyover. On January 10th, law enforcement officials invited Jennifer for an interview. She immediately texted her boyfriend telling him she was a ball of nerves at that point. She was very nervous. A lot of wives get very nervous when they get to the second, third, and fourteenth interview. You see, he said, he told her back, you don't need to be uh, nervous. He reassured her, just keep saying what you have been. You will be fine, he said. Jennifer replied that if police ask her about Lopez, she will tell them that he is an old friend going through a divorce. That's how she knows him. Nothing more, nothing less. Not that she sent thousands of text messages and talked to him over 500 times per day. 
It was then that she hatched the idea for a factory reset of their phones by saying, I am going to factory reset my phone on Sunday night at the leading tech, she added. Now, just thinking in, in the case, they pulled the phone records and asked. She still thought she was one step ahead of police, just like she thought she was one step ahead of them on the day she had her husband killed. Now, on the day of Jennifer's police interview, Lopez was simultaneously arrested in Dixon, Tennessee, not far from his home. Inside his black Nissan Titan, agents found a, a face mask the same color as the one Jennifer had told police the gunman wore. She should have told a lie. She should have said the face mask was black. He didn't have a face mask. Now remember, this is during COVID time. But as police transported Lopez to the local jail station, the investigative team headed for his house simultaneously. There, authorities found a 45 caliber handgun and ballistic tests on that weapon matched the shell casings found at the murder scene in the street. Even more damning, authorities say that there were traces of Jamie's blood still found on the weapon that killed him. Didn't even wash the gun. Didn't take the gun as normal and toss it into the lake somewhere. And Lopez was immediately charged with a federal gun crime, and at the state level he was charged with murder. Now while Lopez was in jail, the control didn't stop. Jennifer asked someone to send him this message from her, which read, I will always be yours. I believe Jennifer did this in order to motivate Lopez to keep his mouth shut. In a lot of these cases, the women will talk to the guy who murdered her husband even in jail, not knowing that people are detecting these calls and letters. And during that same time period, Jennifer transferred a total of $118,000 from her checking account into an account belonging to a third party. I think she wanted to run out of the country personally. And a few days later, she asked another individual to transmit a new message to Ms. Lopez, which read, get this, I just needed to be cautious because every communication is being monitored, she said. Please tell him as soon as possible that I will always be his. Please stay strong for us. Mr. Lopez, who was in custody at this point, responded via the individual, your knight always. Hmm. There's the white knight syndrome. Justin. You're watching Justin. M&M, Justin. the Men's Channel. Justin. It would seem that Jennifer did herself in from the beginning when she gave a description of what Lopez was wearing. Then the night before, the Faith's own ring doorbell camera located on the side of their house captured footage of a man matching Lopez's description in the backyard of an adjacent vacant home. Now this vacant home is torn down now, and you may see that in some photos, but at the time there was a vacant home next door. Then a man can be seen creeping around the property at approximately 2.30 in the morning, the morning Jamie Faith was murdered. Here is the actual grainy video from the Faith security camera. But love was not the only motive that authorities believe prompted Lopez's actions. Federal agents wrote that an examination of Lopez's finances revealed he was having financial difficulties. Lopez was more than $38,000 past due on his mortgage payments, and the water to his home had been shut off the same month of the murder. So there was nothing in the world holding this guy back from taking an assignment. In part, he loved her. In part, he was desperate for money. Now Jennifer was arrested by her own hand in February 2021 after the police discovered that she had exchanged 14,000 text messages with Lopez, who was her high school and college sweetheart. Now she wouldn't talk to her husband who slept in the same bed or ate across the table from her, but she had time to text this guy 500 times a day. Ultimately, Faith was charged with the use of interstate commerce and the commission of murder for hire, which carried with it the death penalty for both individuals. Jennifer had been originally charged with obstruction of justice. That's what happened when she erased those messages off of her phone to which she pleaded not guilty. But those messages erased were to throw police off and they were able to hold her under that one simple act. That way she wouldn't run out of the country. Now in this case, one detective said Jamie faced brutal murder was a tragedy. His death has been a double blow to his family and friends who had just begun to absorb the news of his murder. 
when they were confronted with the evidence of his wife's involvement. And in all of these cases, and we're almost at 50 now, the community was always shocked that a woman did it. The community is always shocked that a wife did it. The community is always shocked that a wife with children would do this. Jennifer Lynn Faith of Oak Cliff, Texas, who convinced her boyfriend to shoot her husband to death, was sentenced to life in federal prison for orchestrating that murder. And she was lucky she got that instead of death penalty because the family chose not to get her to death penalty. We close this case of killer wives that began over two years ago in the COVID season, eight miles from this point in the city of Dallas. and was decided at this federal courthouse in the city of Dallas against Jennifer Lynn Faith, who had her husband assassinated. Jennifer was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole to Aliceville Federal Government Prison. The judge in her case said that she was disgusting for doing what she did to her husband, as well as an evil woman. Until we see you next time on Killer Wives, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Until next time. Ha, 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 ha.